Good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Rousseau. I'm a PSL in the employment team at LexisNexis, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this webinar to discuss some of the issues um, arising from hybrid working and employees being asked to return to the workplace post COVID. This webinar forms part of the LexisNexis Local Authority Insight Series brought to you in association with local government lawyers. I am now delighted to introduce you to our two panellists today. Our first panellist is Alison Cook. Alison is head of public sector at the law firm VWV LLP. She has over 10 years experience in advising clients on a wide range of employment law issues. She has a special interest in advising publicly funded bodies on individual employment issues or situations where the organization is dealing with its workforce um, from a more strategic standpoint, including wholesale organizational change and industrial relations. Alison also advises businesses, charities, emergency services, and the not-for-profit sector on all issues regarding their employees. She is the outgoing chair of the Local Government Training Partnership and regularly contributes to the Local Government Lawyer website. She is fully immersed in the local government sector and in tune with the challenges facing publicly funded organizations. Our second panelist is Felicia Epstein. Felicia is originally from New York. Since moving to London, she qualified as a lawyer and specializes in labor equality and discrimination. She worked as in-house counsel with trade unions and in private practice before commencing work with Brent Council, focusing on employment, education, and governance law. She was previously the head of training in employment law at her firm of private practice. She is co-author of Employment Law Practice, Strategies for Success, published by Sweet and Maxwell in 2009 and regularly writes in legal journals and lectures on legal issues. She is a member of the Employment Lawyers Association, ELA's Legislative and Policy Committee, and regularly chairs ELA responses on government consultations, including most recently on freedom of expression and domestic violence. She recently completed the Law Society Diploma in Law for Local Government. Felicia was the Law Society National Competition Award winner and a recipient of the Award for Women in Law and Employment and Labour Law. She was appointed the Lawyers and Local Government National Lead on Employment Law and recently commenced work as an employment lawyer in the civil service, but is speaking in her private capacity for the purposes of this webinar. Thank you again both for making yourselves available to join us and for agreeing to lead our discussion today. <coughs> Over to you. Alison and Felicia. Uh, thank you very much, John. That's um, quite a lengthy introduction for both of us. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you for that. Um, and thank you also for the opportunity to um, speak um, uh, on this webinar today. So um, uh, Felicia and I are going to be talking about hybrid working and some of the challenges um, that come with that. So. I'm actually um, sitting in my home office um, today, um, but I've also spent three days in the office this week. And I think that's probably fairly typical of uh, my firm's working practices. And I suspect for those who are able to work in an office and work for home, from home, that, that seems to be sort of fairly standard practice um, across the private sector and across the public sector. But of course, this sort of movement towards hybrid working was prompted really, wasn't it, by um, COVID-19 and, and that date in March where we were all told to stay at home and uh, where possible um, work from home. And as time ticked on and we were all um, doing our best to um, um, keep ourselves safe, keep our families safe, um, uh, and then things opened up and then shut back down again and um, opened back up again. The way that we work has really evolved, uh, probably in the most fundamental way, certainly in my professional working life, but um, probably in the modern working era, in fact. And it's lifted a lid, really, hasn't it, on how we work, why we work where we work, um, and how we monitor um, 
how for those who manage people, how we monitor those who work. So, um, I mean, it's just sort of a brief introduction into um, hybrid working. I suppose the first thing really is what is hybrid working? Well, it can be anything really, can't it? It can be working from home, working from the office and home, working from somewhere else, home and an office, um, being truly flexible. Uh, hybrid covers really all permutations of how we work and where we work. Um, and um, it's how that is captured, I suppose, in a formal or an informal way um, in terms of uh, that relationship between employer uh, and employee. But that's just the um, an overview of where we are with with hybrid working. Um, Felicia, what do you think are the, the sort of pros and cons of, of hybrid working that you've experienced or you've had to advise on? Um, well, I think that a lot of employers are now kind of coming to grips and trying to weigh up the advantages and disadvantages. Um, I think the biggest one, which a lot of employers are trying to deal with, and local authorities, it's slightly more challenging, is about kind of the question of reduced costs. I mean, to what extent can you change your physical estate? You know, um, where commercial industries are probably more have more flexibility, where local authorities have these buildings, and what do you do with them if you're actually going to kind of shift the number of people or the, the kind of occupancy rate? So that's the kind of first questions that's very different probably for local authorities than it is for other um, other organizations because you you own these kind of buildings. It's not the same necessarily relationship as a commercial venture. Um, some, you know, some employers, and I think a lot of employees have said that they're more productive in the process um, of working from home. You have less travel time um, associated with stress with it. And, um, and sometimes, and many studies have showed that that kind of has kind of led to increased output. People are very often more motivated um because they're in their own environment um there's um you kind of keep some skills so people have more flexibility so the skills that people have you keep those people kind of working for you it, even if they have a family relocation or new family responsibilities or possibly a disability they're still able to continue to work possibly if they're working from home um, it allows for a wider recruitment uh, because you're kind of opening up your recruitment. Yesterday, I, I don't know if anyone else on the call on the our call was at the ELA conference yesterday. There was a discussion about hybrid working yesterday, and they were talking about two different companies who put out recruitment um, advertisements. And the one that put out um, the option of flexible working got 50% more applicants than the than the organization that put out with that had no mention of flexible working. So your recruitment kind of uh, pool is going to be potentially wider. There's more fle flexibility with your team. You can hire people from different places who can work together in a different way. So you have a bit more flexibility that kind of dovetails with a recruitment issue. Um, and um, you have technological co uh, comp competency. So home workers are more likely to have increased IT and technology skills to enable them to be work effectively from home. So people, we've all upskilled. We all know how to do things that we didn't know, you know, two years ago. So uh, some of us, some of us more so than others. Right. Okay, <laughs> and I yeah. count myself in the in the less so in that. <laughs> but having said that, I think you're probably even if you say that you're we're all we all realize that we're much more resilient than we believed that we were. Yeah. We're all kind of, we all have capacity. As I remember the first session at Brent, just the day before we were all told to go home, we had about a hundred of us clustered in these meetings around a big screen, trying to figure out what Microsoft Teams, how we were gonna work it. I mean, it was kind of amusing having hundred people in a tight space trying to, you know, figure it out. And all of us were kind of, you know, looking very confused, but we all managed. So what are some of the cons involved? <clears throat> you know, you don't have control. There's no control over over your employees. There may be a damage to work culture. Um, there's some fears that people won't pull their weight. That you don't have supervision. That same kind of supervision. And then the question about how much you want to monitor people. Um, there's less face-to-face -face collaboration between colleagues. You have a dispersed workforce. There's less opportunities for on-the-job training. And a lot of people have talked about that it may be well, fine and good for someone who's been in the job for quite a long time who knows people. But what about the junior employees or the people who need mentoring? Um, then there's kind of more difficulty for them to kind of engage. Um, and finally, there's a greater risk of a breach of data, data breaches and confidentiality. 
where you're working on your, are you on your own? Are you printing things out? You kind of access to your computer. And then from the employee's perspective on a living space, who has space at home and, and who's more likely to, to have space at home to work from home? Um, but there's some reports that show, the surveys that show that more people who work from home are less likely to have sickness absence, a lower sickness sickness absence. Um, there's also the potential for isolation and boredom, feeling of alienation for people working on their own. Uh, people miss out on the workplace facilities. Um, and then there's a question about pay being affected. Um, there are some recent studies which show that various companies are considering, com large companies are considering proposing the cut in pay for people who work from home. I think it was Stephen Harwood that just came out the other day and said that they're going to offer 20% reduction if someone wants to home work. Um, so th that's another conversation. And then other conversations about London waiting. Um, so yeah. not a on this call will be from London, but there's a whole question about whether London waiting, why is that? And should it be, you know, is it appropriate to continue that in those circumstances? So I think, does that cover the kind of pros and cons? Yeah, I you think it does. I mean, I, I mean, for, from my perspective, um, when we're looking at some of our junior people, you know, they have spent their, you know, for our trainees, they've spent their training contract basically working on their own at home and and I definitely see from their professional development that, that that's an issue um, and it isn't the same experience as somebody who has been sat in a team and who has benefited you don't realize but it's that process of osmosis isn't it where you're just absorbing all of that information and all of that skill that you just don't get when you're um, sat in your bedroom um, at home. The other thing that, that strikes me just on, on the cons um, is there's an awful lot of people in our office. I've been with VWV, um, I mean, difficult to believe, but I've been with them for over 20 years. So there's not, prior to prior to lockdown, there aren't that many people, even in our four offices, who I don't know or I don't know of. And it struck, it struck me last week when I went to our end of year drinks in our Bristol office that there were quite a few people there that I didn't know. And who, why should they? But they didn't know me either. And in terms of how you develop your culture and your values and your sense of team working, I can really see that over a period of time, depending on how you how you um, manage your hybrid working, I can definitely see a sense of team and a sense of identification and what what your employer, what your organisation represents. I can definitely see that that tapering off. And it's something that I think we need really need to be mindful of. Um, but I think, you know, on the whole, you're absolutely right in terms of the recruitment thing. That is the first thing that our um, people who are uh, applying to, to jobs to us, to, that's almost the first thing. Do you offer flexible working? And of course, we have to say yes, A, because we want to, uh, but B, because all of our competitors and all of the public sector are offering it too. So so we need to make ourselves competitive in, in the recruitment. So how do you go about kind of dealing with that, those requests for hybrid working and flexible working? What do you, what do you, how, how do you see that working out? So we try, we, well, we try to do it on a bit of a case by case basis because each team and each department are, are slightly different in terms of how they organise themselves. And we would, we would want to make sure that there's flexibility in doing that. But I think it's really important that that's documented. Um, and that there's a little bit of flexibility around it. Uh, I think you can find yourself in difficulties where you start saying, um, you know, basically this is a hybrid working relationship or a hybrid working practice, and that's and and it will and it will always be that way. I think you know, as employment lawyers, we always want to make sure that we build in um, an element of flexibility to ensure that if things change. You know, goodness only knows things change very quickly in March 2020. But if things change again or the business evolves in a different way that you hadn't quite foreseen, then you have the flexibility to to change it or to mould it or, or to do something different, obviously, with the requisite uh, consultation, um, etc. So um, that's how we would deal with flexible working requests. I mean, at the moment, hybrid working is essentially flexible working. Um, albeit under a slightly different name. So you would want to deal with it in, in that way. And um, in terms of, um, um, I was going to ask another question and I kind of lost track of it. Anyway, you could you continue on. Sorry. Oh, I know what I was going to say. I was going to say, you know, 
we it's easy for lawyers to kind of have these conversations about flexibility, but within the local authority, there's such a wide range of staff. Yeah, yeah. So, but there are always going to be roles where you know those those client facing, customer facing roles. However, you as a, an organisation call it where you just can't do flexible working, um, and um, there's nothing you can really do about that. You can't change the role of a of a, a road cleaner or a you know um it it just isn't possible so i think again you need to make sure that it's not a carte blanche for everybody because obviously it's not going to work yeah i think you were gonna there was some case that you were gonna kind of mention yeah that was, that was just there's a quite a recent case of walsh and network rail infrastructure limited and that's a classic case of um a flexible working request sort of being agreed and then the employer turning around and saying oh actually we want to uh we want, to, we want it to go back to the way it was or we want to um, look at changing it. But the way that the agreement had been reached made made it more difficult to do so. Um, and and again, it's just about managing people's expectations and just um, putting in enough safeguards to make sure that it's as flexible as it needs to be. And I think I would certainly advise that people have regular check ins to say, look, is this arrangement working? Is it? Is it giving the organisation what it needs from you? And are we giving what, what you need? Um, just a case, an example, one of my team has just come back from maternity leave uh, this week and um, we were just chatting through what's the best way of making sure that we're in the office at the, at the same time so that I can make sure that she's got enough to be doing and supervise and um, enough time out of the office so that suits her other needs and works with me as well. And it's just about having that dialogue and constantly checking in with one another to make sure that that it's working for everybody. Right. So the local authorities may be in a position where they have some kind of overall overarching guidelines and then they have to um, pass on those kind of decisions to each manager or the different, yeah. different groups to make their own kind of assessments about what's appropriate within their departments. Yeah. And again, you know, deal with it consistently and and fairly. I mean, you're always going to have nationally agreed terms and conditions, aren't you? And then you'll have your net, your more local uh, agreements that will be in place. And within those local agreements, they'll be much more, um, even more local in the sense of, you know, department by department or um, team by team. Um, did you want to talk about um, people coming back into the office and some of the challenges around that? Yeah, so I think we were kind of one of the big questions that people are very often that we're often asked is how can you require people to return to the office because everyone's so comfortable and you know it's 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 not an easy thing necessarily. So obviously number one it depends on government guidance which has changed now providing a safe workplace whatever that means in the circumstances now. Um and as you said before the needs of the business um what does the contract say? You know, we've kind of almost thrown contracts out of the window, yeah. but there is a contract under there somewhere. And ultimately, that's what's still in existence. And I think, um, sorry, just to cut in on that, Felicia, I think that they're starting to become a bit of an argument that they're, that certainly when you look at um, when you look at some of the, the chat around civil servants and the Jacob's, Jacob Rees-Mogg um, no. I haven't. I don't have any note on my desk, no. but I haven't been there to receive it. <laughs> but you can see a situation where employees are going to turn around and say, well, do you know what? Notwithstanding what's written into my letter, I have a reasonable expectation to now work flexibly. And actually, that's been over two and a half years and nobody has come to me and said, oh, um, we're going to keep this under review. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. So I, I would be interested to see whether or not, as you say, contractually, people start um start waving that around and saying, well, notwithstanding what my contract says, I think there's been a variation. So yeah. I think that would be an interesting, um, an interesting argument. Sorry, interrupted so you. Think, yeah, so just following on from that, you know, I think what we're saying is that employers should be consulting any regardless, meaning you don't just kind of say what well, next day, that's the end of it. You have to be consulting with, you know, whatever the structures are in your, in each local authority, how, you know, how, what, what's appropriate and how it's going to work out so that people feel like they're buying in and they understand what the possibilities are. And of course, going back to the whole issues of reasonable adjustments, you still need to kind of think about that kind of disability and what's appropriate for each person. And then definitely a phased return. 
um, is advisable. You don't want to just say shock tomorrow. This is it. You want to have some kind of phase return to the workplace and not a kind of blanket, um, you know, answer of this is what has to happen tomorrow. So I think there's a kind of, you know, there's a kind of, you know, logical and kind of reasonableness around how you approach that. I don't think there's a black and white answer, but there is some ACAS guidance about that, isn't there? There is ACAS guidance, which which um, basically um, talks about um, very much very much in line with what you say about um, consulting with the workforce uh, in terms of getting them back into the office. There's also ACAS guidance on flexible working, which is what hybrid working um, comes under, and it basically um, just um, talks about the process for making a flexible working request, which probably most people are quite comfortable with now. Um, uh, essentially, it's making the request, uh, asking for the request to be considered, and then the employer uh, making a determination on uh, whether that request can be agreed to and, and all the <clears throat> set reasons that you can give for turning a request down. I, I think really it's quite difficult for employers really now to say, no, you can't work flexibly given what we've all gone through. It might be around the date, number of days that you work, which is, has always been the case. Um, just one, just just dancing around a little bit. Um, interestingly, the there was a proposal from the government that um, flexible working could become the default position, um, and that had been set out in the employment bill. And interestingly, the employment bill wasn't included in the Queen's speech uh, this week. And uh, for me, that was quite interesting. <clears throat> I don't know whether the government feel they don't have sufficient legislative time to deal with it or whether within the administration it doesn't quite fit with um, their current position or uh, whether it's just been kicked down the road. I'm not sure at the moment. It would be interesting to see what happens. But uh, it's so, I, w I can't imagine the flexible uh flexible working being the default position for somebody like Jacob rees -Mogg. So <laughs> I think... Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, even though I'm a civil servant, I have no inside information about that. And the only thing I can say is from the ELA perspective, when that came out the other day, because I sit on this legislative and policy committee, um, there was, you know, some level of shock and horror that, you mm -hmm. know, all the work and all the time that's gone well, into a lot of Yes. And, and I think that's right, isn't it? And, and and all of the rationale that was put forward about being a modern workforce and 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 having a modern a modern and flexible economy and, and all of those sorts of things, and then it just wasn't in there. So um, we shall see, I suppose. Disappointing, but not surprising. Yeah, it just it's also frustrating because a lot of people put a lot of time into commenting and engaging, yeah. and then you feel a certain sense of despair that. Um, that that's, you know, that you're not, you know, the work is not, is not, you're not being listened to. Um, yeah. So, you know, um, yeah. So, I mean, even though we were, you know, we talked about the contract and we said that there's some kind of issue, there's, you know, p potentially a way around and there are kind of questions that could be asked. There are contract issues that, you know, need to be overcome to make some changes. So I just wanted to kind of lay them out for people and uh, and hear your thoughts on that also, um, Alison. So contracts of employment um, for office based staff uh, tend to specify employers office as the place of work um, and um, we often we would often expect that if a remote working or some form of hybrid working to be made permanent, the contract should usually be amended to reflect this. Mm -hmm. And then there's a question about whether you want to or not, because you want to kind of maintain flexibility that you were talking yeah. about before. Um, and but a move to home working or hybrid working could fall within the scope of existing term of contract. For example, it's quite common for a contractual term governing places of work to state your normal place of work is and then the employer's main office or such other place as may, we may reasonably determine. So there could be some flexibility already built into some people's contracts. Um, and some employers, as we said, may wish to retain discretion over remote working so they have the ability to review, withdraw the arrangement at any time. So that you want you may want to have some kind of your own flexibility, the employer flexibility built into that arrangement. But there's a risk, as we said before, as you said before, about the informal or discretionary arrangement can become contractual through custom and practice. 
So the tr traditional requirement for the implication of contractual term in this manner would be that it has to be reasonable. I'm just going back to a contract um, law for everyone here. Notorious, which I love that word, and certain. So uh, it must be fair and not arbitrary or capricious, and it must be generally established and well known, and it must be clear cut. Um, so I, I, normally, I normally say oh, just on that um, variation point, I, I often say to my clients, well, look, if you were to have a chat with a, a group of employees <clears throat> and you'd say, well, what, what's the position on this? And they all come back and say, oh, well, it's, you know, of course, we've got the right to, to work from home. Um, we've been doing it for X number of years. Uh, that's usually a pretty good indication that there has been a, a variation by by implication. Um, and um, obviously, you've you've cited the the legal test, <laughs> um, and I've gone to the um, the practical. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, I mean, obviously, all of those contractual issues are so, are, are supported by policies and procedures, aren't they? Um, and as employment lawyers, we often, I think the first thing I always say to my clients are, what does the contract say and have you got a policy on that? Um, and again, it's about how you um, how you put your policy together, how you engage with your workforce in putting that policy together and building in sufficient um, flexibility within the policy so that it works for both the employees and the employer. So things like... Um, a trial period, see if it works, um, in what circumstances things might change, so sufficient flexibility to bring that kind of a working arrangement to an end, um, things about working time, what your expectations are about the, the minimum amount of time that people are going to be in the office or at home or, or however you want to uh, arrange your working. I was really interested what you said, Felicia, about the um, reduction in um, pay and the London waiting uh, around um, paying conditions. And that, that is really interesting because people who work in London do get a significant um, London waiting. And and there's been a good argument for that, hasn't there? Um, well, in terms of the cost of living. What, yeah, the question is to what to what it's actually based on. We have we all say we know what it is, but the question is, do we really know what it is? And yeah, has and it's it properly been, quantified? Yeah, and it's been a perception, hasn't it, that um, it's more expensive to live, work and um, move around London. <clears throat> but actually, um, you know, if you've got some of your staff living in Devon or uh, Cumbria or uh, Birmingham, or places that are generally, uh, those are probably not very good examples, actually, but uh, places where it's generally accepted, it is uh, less expensive to live in. Live in. How relevant are those London waitings uh, now uh, to pay? And, and should employers be looking at that? And that's a really interesting point. Um, so um, perhaps hybrid policies could build those factors into it. That, look, if you're going to spend... 70% of your working time working from home, then we need to look at how that that looks in terms of uh, any of your additional benefits that you get as a result of, of working from wherever. I've certainly saved money on travelling in and out of work and, and buying food out and all of those sorts of obviously my choices, but you can see that there are cost savings. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to mention before that while we kind of slightly skirted over the contract issues the the big problem is if you don't have agreement you know we kind of talk about the solutions but there are yeah. times when you're going to have a situation where um, you're not going to have an agreement and then there may be a situation where someone resigns and there's always a risk of a constructive unfair fair dismissal claim on yeah. that basis so yeah. it's not, you know it's not it's not um you know risk free these kinds of situations and the kind of um you know the problems that we may face yeah I mean, uh, it's, not, it's, it's not beyond the uh, realms of possibility is it depending on how important whatever those change those contractual changes are to your organization that you you may find yourself in a difficult position of having to fire and rehire i hate that expression you know we always talk about um terminating uh, and re-engaging don't we <laughs> same thing but um and there there may well be situations where you will need to do that and certainly 
you know, we've advised lots of times that in situations like that where changes to T's and C's are having to be made and we can't get the agreement through the union. Um, and, and, and that's sort of the, the, the last resort, really. For me, I think flexible working or hybrid working, whatever you want to call it, is something which is is less controversial than some of the other changes that you and I have probably dealt with during our careers. And And you would hope that both parties would come to the table with a very pragmatic approach in terms of what's needed um, and, and what what uh, can be agreed to. But um, but again, you know, you'd want to make sure that any changes that you make build in sufficient flexibility, because I do think that whilst we are two years on, just looking at some of the comments that you and I have made about hybrid working and some of the things that are cropping up, I do feel that we are still evolving and it is still changing. And I don't think we've, we've reached, if ever we will, a situation where we'll say, right, that, that's what it is now. I think people's circumstances change. I think an organisation's um, objectives change and that often requires flexibility from both parties as to how to achieve those things. So you, you, you need to ensure that your policies and procedures and the contractual documents sit behind it give you enough flexibility to, to flex with those changing um, working priorities. Just a few minor legal points I wanted to mention because I think we need to get them in there just um, to kind of put people in the same headspace we are, which they probably are already. But sometimes there are situations where employers acceptance or refusal of a remote working arrangements can affect the fairness of a dismissal itself, meaning um, so even though the range of reasonable responses test for unfairness prevents tribunals from substituting their own views on remote working for those of the employer, there are situations where they may find that a failure to kind of even consider an alternative working arrangement may make the dismissal unfair. So there was a, a, a case not that long ago. It's an employment tribunal case where someone who was living in Croydon um, and it was a British, it was against British gas trading. They commuted to the office in Staines, and then that office was closed, and they were they were sought to move them to the Windsor office. They relied on a mobility clause and the, the kind of employee's contract that allowed it to change the place of work to any other place within a reasonable daily traveling distance of their residence. And then the tribunal found that A's eventual dismissal when she refused to accept the move was fair. Um, a is the person had proposed alternatives, including increasing her working home working days from two to three days per week. However, the tribunal found that it was reasonable for the company to reject the suggestion, having regard to the fact that its policy was to allow only one day home working, and so it already accommodated A to some extent by allowing two days. So they considered it, they thought about it, but the the fact that they considered it and thought about it was part of the assessment of the tribunal about whether it was fair to yeah. have you know, her dismissal. So I think yeah. that's important um, to kind of be aware that every decision, as you said, needs to be carefully considered. It can't yeah. be just kind of yeah. blanket yes or no. Yeah, and, and also in that case, the, the tribunal would have carefully um, evaluated what the business case was. Yeah, uh, and the reasons why um, they couldn't do any more than one day working from home, and um, and all of the other representations that the employee would have made, and um, uh, yeah, as you say, it's not a one size fits all, is it? Every every workplace is different, has different priorities. So the, I mean, some of the, some of the other discrimination issues that that we know about that you know jump out to us are indirect sex discrimination, yeah. disability discrimination. Um, and so one of the things that you said before, which is really important, which is consistency, that yeah. it has to be some consistency in every evaluation um, and that and, and you have to kind of come up with some criteria of how you're going to make these decisions. Um, and um, yeah, so regardless of whether the arrangements are discretionary or contractual, you're always going to have to kind of consider each case in, a, in an equality issue. So um, very often there's we know there's a disproportionate um, effect of child care responsibilities still on women, even though men have clearly stepped up to the plate and been more involved in that and also caring responsibilities as well. Yeah, uh, I, I definitely think that um, you know we're an aging population and I think whilst the childcare uh, is po quite possibly because from a personal perspective my children are a little bit older now and my parents are now aging so 
<laughs> so just as I move away from the, you know, the really intense child caring um, period, um, so I definitely think that, that looking after dependents, however they are um, defined, is, is more and more of an issue for, for our working population, for sure. And also this by kind of by extension, the disability by association. So it's yeah. not just the caring responsibility, but also the um, caring of someone who's disabled. And so the elderly person or a distant person who's not elderly but disabled, those are other situations where we may find, and there have been a, re a few recent cases which have kind of addressed exactly those issues, but taking into account to what extent um, did the employer consider the employee's wishes? Did they try to accommodate? Did they look at the business case? You know, so it's all about how much engagement there was and how how much the employer was um, considered in, ter in terms of their assessment mm -hmm. um, in terms of which which me meant that they were either they were protected or not protected in their decision making in terms of allowing a different kind of work home working relationship. Yeah, and I suppose that flows on to the next point, doesn't it, really, which is about um, the medically vulnerable returning to the workplace. Um, and the risks um, to them um, in relation to COVID and, and the extent to which reasonable adjustments applies to those individuals um, in terms of getting them back into the workplace or or not. Um, and I think, um, you know, we during COVID, less so now, but during COVID, we've certainly had um, cases where uh, individuals, just what you were touching on, Felicia, about um, people who uh had caring responsibilities for those who were shielding and therefore were saying well i can't come into the workplace because my uh disabled um dependent who is clinically extremely vulnerable um and and, and i can't come back into the workplace and that's the reason why and obviously the advice around that would be well let's look at reasonable adjustments um and let's look at the risk around associative dis disability discrimination i think pragmatically um it's about speaking to those who consider themselves medically vulnerable, understanding what makes them medically vulnerable and trying to reassure them around the steps that you've taken um, to ensure that the workplace is a safe place of work. So all of your health and safety risk assessments, um, explaining those and then trying to understand what it is and what further steps you may or may not be able to take to encourage them back into the workplace. Of course, there will always be those people who um, you're not able to reintegrate into the workplace. And for those, actually, homeworking will remain, will continue to remain um, at the, the way that they provide services to the organisation that they work for to the, ex to the extent that they can. Um, and I think that will just need to be kept um, kept under review as as things change and as our journey through COVID uh, continues. Um, so I think it's it's for me it's always about explaining, talking, understanding, and then thinking through what what is possible and, and what is not possible. Um, I mean, it's all all about making sure that people's well-being is looked after and that um, adequate health and safety is is reviewed. I don't know if you've got any thoughts about that, Felicia. Um, I, yeah, I think it's as you were saying, it's, it, it seems to be a balance between worrying about are you adequately kind of getting this the kind of it's like that mutually mutuality of obligation. Is the employee providing what they need to without, you know, with the with the supervision they have in place versus are um, are they also being taken care of? Are they able to be taken care of in that situation? And that's complicated. And the last thing I was going to say is something that, that I think we alluded to, which is that everyone seems to be flexible these days. And kind of the recruitment issue for local authorities is is not and also for central government is not is not a non-issue. It's a real issue and yeah. will be bigger issue now. So you're in a competitive workplace. And so to a certain extent, that has to be has to figure into your assessment about what you're able to offer your employees um, in terms of level of flexibility, how you monitor it, how you supervise it, how you ensure mental health and um, kind of good working conditions. Those are all part of the figure, but you also need to take the commercial view as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I suppose, you know, actually, the local government and central government 
<laughs> having a flexible working policy and flexi days and, and toil and all those sorts of things have been attractive, but less attractive now because most other employers are, are offering it. So, um, you know, that, that's a bit of a downside in recruitment, I think, for the public sector. I think Jean's appeared on the screen, so I think that's our cue to uh, <laughs> to deal with any questions that may have come in. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alison and Felicia, for such an interesting and informative um, discussion. You've covered an enormous amount in the short time available and given us a clear insight into the issues that I think about 10 minutes left um, to, to, to work through those. So I think we'll make a start, if that's OK. Um, the first one, I think that there are there are two dealing with sort of returning to work issues. Um, the first in relation to employees who who, who may be medically vulnerable um, for a discrete period of time. So the organisation may have a policy that if you're med medically vulnerable, you can work from home. But what what is the situation if you've got someone who is medically vulnerable for, for a very short period of time or for a, a particularly or discrete period of time? Do you have any any sort of tips in, in relation to how to manage that? I think if it, uh, Felicia, are you happy for me to run with this? Yeah. Um, yeah, go for it. I think if you've got somebody who is medically vulnerable uh, and can't work in the office but can work from home, then I think for the period that they remain vulnerable, you probably should agree to allow them to work from home, but on the understanding that there is a um, there is a period uh, um, where it will continue, where it will be reviewed, and then you can continue to review it. Um, if it, and I think you just need to keep it under review. Really, I don't think if I don't think in those circumstances I would be comfortable forcing somebody back into the office if they were unwell. Um, I suppose the other piece to that is. Um, you know whether there is any sick leave issue with this and and um, I suppose that would just need to be considered in a bit more detail I'm not sure whether that answers the question um, I'd hope so thank you I think there's, a, there's a, another question that's related that um, is is just below that one dealing with um, staff who simply refuse to come back to work and whether you have any sort of practical tactics for how to deal with that situation? I think the first thing we said was, we talked about before was consultation. Um, the more people are involved in the process, the more they're likely to agree. But it, you can't you can't control, that's, there are always gonna be people who are not gonna be happy. Um, and it's not possible to kind of satisfy everyone. And there are gonna be people who are going to refuse. and. You know, at some point you're going to have to make a decision about how you're going to approach that, which is, you know, ultimately has to be a kind of um, if your policy is going to be that the office attendance for the people for their particular team is X and they don't want to, then that ultimately could lead to a termination. I, I don't think I think it's you know, I think that that's the direct I mean, like that's the situation if anyone refuses um, it kind of a clear um, policy or a clear for everyone, There's, unless they have a specific reason why they can't, um, and they'd have to kind of provide evidence and support for that. Um, Alison, do you see any well, think, other? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that goes goes to you know you're starting to go down the. Um, it sounds awfully formal, but it it goes down the um, failure to obey a reasonable order, mm -hmm. um, and that's that's very master and servant type language, but th that is that is a conduct issue um, and it may well be that if you've tried all of the um, tactics that Felicia's just run through in terms of consulting, asking what it is that that means um, they don't want to come back into it or why is it they don't want to come back into the office and trying to understand that but but ultimately you may end up uh, um, it may end up becoming a conduct issue. Just just interestingly one of the things very quickly one of the things that we've done is is looking at ways to make our workplace more attractive so to try and incite people back in, which to me, um, I think it's my age, but to me that just is a bit ridiculous because, you know, your place of work is the office, so you go to work, you go to the office, but um, that that's not where we are um, as a culture. And so what we are trying to do is look at ways to, to get people back in and make it a, a more attractive and more interesting workplace to be. And hopefully that will fit in with our cultures and values. 
Um, I've heard of an employer who started um, providing snacks and that worked yeah. well. And yeah. treats and snacks got people back to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 all about that and having different um, things for different days of the weeks, which brings the teams together and provides. And as I said, you know, I talked about some of the concerns around culture and I've just looked at um, somebody who's um, got that there as well. Um, do you want me to deal with the home insurance one? I was about to move on to the next one. Yes. Please. Yeah. Um, so that that is an interesting one, isn't it? Because our home insurance policies probably don't actually uh, envisage um, envisage this. Um, would it be reasonable to ask employers for recompense for additional payments like this? Well, it's something that can be put on the table, but I sus suspect that an employer will probably turn around and say, well, you know what, it swings and roundabouts because you're not having to pay to travel into work and all of the additional costs that go with that. Um, I don't think it's unreasonable, though, um, and um, it's something that employees might want to, to table with their employer once you've got all the information in front of you in terms of what those additional costs look like. Felicia, do you want yeah. to the next one, the working pattern one? Yeah, yes. so you talked about given that hybrid working is now becoming permanent, should an individual contract be changed? Yeah, I think that goes back to the question of the balance between flex, maintaining a certain amount of flexibility and at the same time wanting to ensure that you don't um, con you don't um, agree to a situation which turns into their a contractual entitlement, meaning does the hybrid working become um, a custom and practice where everyone assumes that is now the contract and you're not confident, as an employer, you're not happy with that necessarily being the case. So as an employer, you need to make a decision as to whether you want that to be the case or not before you kind of allow it to happen. Um, you need to, I think you need to be, you need to plan. It doesn't mean that your decision is not something that's going to change in a year from now, but you need to make a decision as to what you're going to do. I heard yesterday at this hybrid working um, um, discussion, uh, the in-house counsel for Oracle, and he was saying for Oracle, which is based all over the world, and he's based at home, and they haven't made a decision yet. Um, mm. They they haven't made a decision yet. Um, and he said part of the reason why we haven't made a decision yet is because kind of waiting for other people to make the decisions and see what works and doesn't work. Yeah. You know, so I see I think that there is I think there's some sense in that. Having said that, you will need to make a decision. You know, you need to jump one way or the other. You may jump and say, well, actually, we're going to leave it as the way it is. The contracts that they are, but we're going to kind of create this hybrid working policy. And we appreciate that that means that people's contracts may you know, may may uh, incorporate this hybrid working, but you do need to make a decision about it. Mm. I think part of part of that, just to add to that, Felicia, is 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 that the um, uh, what I what I just said a moment ago, which was I'm not sure that we're really at that place where we actually know, certainly from my perspective, uh, and I don't think that I'm alone in this, is that I'm not sure that we've quite reached a point at which we want to make a decision about. Yeah definitively what hybrid working looks like yeah um, and we're still evolving and goodness you know if you told me three years ago we'd all be going home on a date in March 2020 and, and working from home for the next 18 months you know almost exclusively I, I would have sort of scratched my head and and I wonder therefore in another 18 months what 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 working life is going to look like and um, so I think that's probably the reason why I'd, I, I would want to make sure that there is enough flexibility so that both parties um, can get to a position that, that work properly rather than having it you know set in stone now. Yeah. Uh -huh. two, sorry carry on. I was just going to kind of jump to the next question which yes, is about. Exactly. <laughs> the, two, uh, the two questions on contracts so yes indeed. Uh, one is about working three days a week from uh, from home and two days in the office as a contract still need to state the contractual base is the office. I don't th I think most contracts will state that already and I don't think there's a need to change that necessarily mm -hmm. at all. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, the follow up question is that if the place of work is stated as the office, but the default position is that employees are working from home. At should, the moment, at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and I think that. Do you recommend that, that there's a contractual change? I think to the that's a problem. Um, I, I suspect if there's going to be a contractual change, it will be um, 
that the place of work remains flexible. And if, and if the employer reasonably requests for you to return to the office or work from the office, then, then that will probably will be what, what will be in the office. Uh, sorry, in the in the something that we do have to the only thing I was going to say, sorry, Alison, is that we, which we didn't say before, which we just, I think, assumed is, you know, as we all know, you can't just kind of change the contract without agreement. Yeah. So there's a whole set of possible ways of approaching changes of contract. Um, and, but you're not going to be able to change it unilaterally. There's going to have to be some agreement about how the contract's going to be changed. Either it's by way of collective agreement or it's going to be terminating the agreement and re-engagement or you're going to agree the change. Is, um, or you think that you can rely on the existing contract to make the change? Okay, and just um, some of I think you've gone. Alison's gone lost. We've lost her. Oh, okay. Um, am I? Am I? Can you hear me? She's, yes. Yes, um, we can hear you back. Can, can you see She's, me? Yes. Okay. I think Felicia might. Yes, yeah, sorry. Be. I can't yeah. see you, but I can. But that's me. See, yeah. This is a, this is a prime example of hybrid working, isn't it? Yes. Um, we've had. Uh, yeah. I like this. Exactly. I like this. This one working from abroad. We've. I, I've had to deal with this, and um, it's complicated. Is is the answer to this one? Um, we have said in a number of circumstances we're not able to. Or, or you know, the clients have said we're not able to do this, partly because of the tax issues and. Um, uh the the tax rules around working in another jurisdiction or a business over here there's also an issue around your statutory rights under the employment rights act um of working abroad as well so that's not to say it can't be done it can be done um but often it's it's hard and employers tend to file it under the hard um, category and, and say no, and and that's fine. They're entitled. They're able to do that. Mm. Don't know, Felicia, if you've got any views on that. Um, no, I, 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 uh, it, it's it's an awkward situation because a number of people moved abroad and yeah. have been happy with their life, and now, um, and then uh, kind of, it's, it's it's quite a it's quite a tricky situation. Um, I've had that with a number of people who work in schools and the front, not not facing schools directly, but, but yeah. yeah. Um, right. So we talked about there's a question here about local government in London waiting contractual to yes. where the local is relevant of place of work. Yeah, that's true. True. Yes. Yeah, yeah that is yeah. true. Um, and that's a decision that people make about going to work in the in the in in, in um, local authority. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I quite like the uh, comment that's been the, the question. Are there really cost savings by working from home with utility prices so high and la la la? Um, yeah, I, I agree with that. And then I'm, my husband works from home as well and I keep turning the heating off and he keeps switching it back on again. So um, it would be very interesting, wouldn't it, to see the difference in um, in costs. Um, I think we're, we're all having to think in a slightly different way now, aren't we, because of the, those additional costs. Um, the next one, would it be reasonable for an employee to insist on working in a certain if they're vulnerable and do not have to use? Uh, for me, that's a reasonable adjustments type question. Um, and I think that that would have to be considered as to whether it was reasonable um, uh, for that individual and whether that can be accommodated. So for me, that feels like a reasonable adjustments question. Um, and whether it's reasonable or not will depend on the individual circumstances of that person, the role that they do uh, and the office that they say they can or can't work in. Okay. Um, um, there's some question here about non-managers yeah. addressing isolation of workforce yes. team and learning team culture. Um, yeah, I think that if you're a non-manager, then you need to speak to your manager about those kind of issues because managers are, be, you know, this is one of the top of their lists in terms of trying to figure out how they're going to work more effectively and to ensure that people don't feel isolated and that there is a kind of team culture. So I think that you need to speak to your manager about that or raise a concern higher up if your manager is not listening to those kinds of issues. Mm. Um, and then 
maybe as a last question, because we are at time, um, we've spoken a lot about tips of, for, you know, for people who, who, who want to continue working from home and refusing to come to the office. There's a question here about any tips for dealing with staff who simply wish to return to the old normal and work from the office 100% of the time, so therefore refuse any home working. Um, uh, Felicia, I'm quite happy to take this one, if that's okay with you. Um, we have, sure. I, I certainly see in, in, in my firm um, that there are people who want to return to the old normal. They feel um, more comfortable working from the office and it's for such a wide variety of reasons. One of my colleagues has got very young children and he finds it easier working in the office all the time. Um, some people just find it easier working and, and are more productive in the office. And we're lucky that we're able to uh, um, accommodate that. We're able to accommodate people working uh, full time or 100 percent of their working time from the office um, or home working and hybrid working. So um, I'm not sure that I, I there's obviously a reason behind this question. I'm, I'm not quite sure I understand unless it's unless it's a capacity issue in a in an office that's now become smaller as a result of um, more people working from home. Um, again, I suppose it's chatting to them and working out what it, what I it is. I think there's just enough, something else that might be behind it as well, um, yeah. which relates to the last question there, which is um, lo local authorities, um, some of them, um, have hired beyond their capacity to seat everyone at the same, yeah. you know, in the in the buildings. I know Brent certainly was like that. I know the local gov central government is that way. So, um, and then the question becomes, as you said, capacity in terms of people working in the office. Yeah. I, I'm not sure there's necessarily. Um, I don't think. I think that. Um, it, there's usually going to you're usually going to be able to balance it out between the people who want to work from home yeah. and the people who want to work from the office to try to find a balance yeah. um, and enough space for people. And in terms of a local authority having a duty to pro a proper place of working in the office, yes, you know, you, you have to think about the risks and um, the risks for individuals, issues about violence in the home and all those kinds of issues. Yeah. If people, you know, because domestic violence in the home yeah. is the issues that have come up before, um, you need to think about that in terms of providing someone with a, a safe workplace as well. Um, do you have a duty? Well, you have a duty of care to your employees. So to a certain extent, you do have a duty. The question is whether you're whether, you know, if you have a, uh, an office and you're providing an office for people to work in, if they want to work there permanently, that may be, an, you know, that's something that you have to consider depending on the circumstances that they're um, that they're in. Um, and my guess is that you're not going to have a real problem between the people who want to work from home some of the time yeah, and the people who actually want to work in the office. You're yeah, going to be able I to think balance. it would be quite unusual for it not to sort of um, uh, even out so that it, it becomes a problem that, or, you know, it isn't, it isn't really a, a problem for you. But yeah, I agree. OK, well, I think um, it's time, you know, we've, we, we, we're at time now. So I just wanted to thank um, Alison and Felicia very much. I think we're going to draw it to a close. I'm sorry we haven't had time to answer all of the questions on the Slido. Um, but I want to thank you all very much for joining us this afternoon and for your participation. I hope you found it a helpful session and a big thank you once again to our speakers, Alison and Felicia, for their engaging contribution to this discussion. I, I hope everyone has a very good weekend. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.